what we've been trying to do is lay a foundation for uh, part of this, for be how, how we might witness really to the world. And I'll tell you, uh, I'm not ancient, but I'm old enough that when I grew up, you learned to witness to people by telling them, you know there's a God, you know spiritual laws and things as to why that you, you need to be saved and how Jesus did that. Well, those two assumptions that you know there's a God and you know you're a sinner are, are not something that people acknowledge today anymore. And so uh, what you almost have to do is start with nothing and convince them there is indeed a universe uh, and that that God has created the universe in such a way that there's evidence that suggests he has your benevolence, your good in mind. And that your consciousness would be so connected in such a way that it makes sense for you to look for how God might have revealed himself to you. In such a way that it makes sense for you to look for how God might have revealed himself to you. And so when we do that, looking for a superior being, how might God reveal himself? And that's kind of uh, been a basis for evangelism in a postmodern world. Uh, how do we share our faith evangelism in a postmodern world? Uh, how do we share our faith with people? Or how do we strengthen our faith when it's no longer assaulted in the same way it was 50 years ago? It's assaulted by people who, in some cases, just deny every premise that there is a God. And now there's a God, why should I? Why do I care? You know, it's, and so it's, it's, it, it changes a little bit as we want to share our faith with our grandkids or our neighbors. So I hope you've uh, appreciated at least the approach here. We began, is it reasonable to believe in God? And then last week, I guess it was two weeks ago, we kind of developed this revelation. Is, is, does revelation make sense? Um, I have a photo to show you if I can. This is uh, from Raphael's School of Athens, from the Italian Renaissance. The character over here, uh-oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh-oh. That's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, now I've, now I've really done it. Okay, there we go. That was the wrong one. I'm trying to get the uh, laser pointer. There we go. This is Plato, and this is Aristotle. Okay? One of the things that you are drawn to in... One of the things that you are drawn to in this painting is, uh, by the way, if you, if you look this up, you'll see all of the classical, and, and if you want to find one that enumerates who's who, because all the great philosophers, thinkers, and scientists of the classical era are painted here, even though, so it's like, it's like a class photo of all the great philosophers that never got together. But one of the things that you'll see is Plato with his hand pointing upward, because as we talked about, Plato believed in divine things. He was weird about his divinity, and I do not suggest anyone follow his doctrine, but he hated that there were divine forms, divine shapes. He thought the key to knowledge was beginning with the divine. Take a look at Aristotle. His gesture is more like this. This is about science, what we can observe, what we can know around us. And the two of them, what what has happened in our world the idea that it's built on and even confined only to those things that we can see and know around us. And what we, what we needed to do by talking about Revelation was be able to argue or at least convince people that it makes sense, like Plato, to look outside for things. That this back the origin of the universe, we come to a point where there is no before. And so that's why we look for Revelation to solve it when the knowledge around us fails. I hope, I hope that makes sense. And this is a beautiful, you'll find this print in a lot of places. It really is a beautiful one. Find this print in a lot of places. It really is a beautiful one. So that's kind of a review thus far. We, we've suggested that inference, uh, evidence from the universe around us gives us a good reason to believe in God. That's session one, we talked about that. That the um, inference from creation gives us um, inference from creation gives us clues as to the nature of God. You remember that Romans told us that that would be this, the case. That there are things about the nature of God that are actually revealed in just the scientific evidence that we can find in our own creation. The intricacy in how we are made in our DNA and the molecules and things like that. 
God exists and has created us uh, with specific care and purpose, he will have to reveal more de detailed information to us about him and his plans for us. We will not be able to infer on our own. There's no ladder we're going to build to that supreme or superior being. A being capable of creating the universe that you and I exist in is capable of, is capable of avoiding us if he wants to. And so we're, we're reliant on that revelation. And then we, we talked about what form would that take. One was the clues in the universe around us, like a fish tank. We'd put clues into the fish tank. We'd communicate within our language. And then at some point there would be some direct... Communicate within our language. And then at some point there would be some direct interaction. And that leads us to tonight's topic. Uh, and that is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And, and the reason that we are settling in on that is that is... The direct, the direct interaction of God into this universe. Um, these are the things that we can deduce with just the Aristotelian knowledge. And even though that doesn't prove it, it is more than coincidental that that's, that makes sense. So as a book of Revelation, the Bible meets that criteria. And it also explains things we talked a few about last week. It explains things like the nature of human sin. It explains the, the problems we have with morality. It, 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 it prophecies that would be the... So uh, this is uh, Michelangelo. And uh, this is on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It's... Uh, it's important to notice this. You've, you, this is one of the most famous frescoes in the world. Stretching to connect with man. Man's hand is portrayed by Michelangelo as the lazy one on the left. Not quite as enthusiastic about reaching. So this is the nature of Revelation. The direct interaction that God has had in man. And I will assert has taken the form of a person in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers uh, through the prophets at many times and at various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. So that's exact verse that declares the glory of God, direct communication with prophets. But finally, the son. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by the powerful world, word. After he provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven. Majesty in heaven. So this is what I believe we're going to, we're going to investigate tonight. Who is Jesus? We've led to the point where Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. But what if you don't believe that? What if your neighbor or your friend doesn't believe that? As a matter of fact, uh, I grew up, or your friend doesn't believe that. As a matter of fact, uh, I grew up, I remember having a professor who said that I'm not, he was, he said to me, quote, I'm not even sure Jesus ever really lived. Because outside the Bible, there's no evidence for him. I didn't know enough to answer him then, but enough to answer him then, but that's not true at all. And I don't want to overdo this, but I'd like to, like Aristotle, I'd like to examine the evidence for Jesus' life and what we can conclude apart from the Bible for a few minutes as to who Jesus was. And I begin with one of the most famous, Josephus is the common name, although he's Titus Flavius Josephus. He was born in Jerusalem, a Jew, and became, he defected and became a Roman right before, like in 69, right before the destruction of the temple in 70. He may have actually helped the Romans do it. Uh, uh, because he was part, he actually fought on the Jewish side. Um, he uh, was part of a, a force that was trapped somewhere and they all surrendered. Uh, he uh, convinced the, uh, let's see, it would have been Vespasian was the Roman general. He convinced him to spare his, uh, let's see, it would have been Vespasian was the Roman general. He convinced him to spare his life because he had prophecies about him and he could be an interpreter for him. And so Vespasian did. And Josephus treated him well. And eventually um, uh, he, he then also helped the, uh, 
Vespasian sons. So it, this, there's, there's a lot of, uh, he had a lot of ties to some real heavy-duty Roman people. And uh, after, after uh, he helped out the Romans, he was freed and made a Roman citizen. And he took the name Titus. Flavius, which was the family name of all the emperors in the family of Titus, approximately 100 A.D. He wrote about many of the things that we're going to talk about. Here's one of the things that Josephus wrote. I hope you can see this. This is just to remember now. If you were just an atheist historian, you would be confronted with this information about Jesus. Uh, Volume Antiquities, Volume 9, he was talking about... uh, brought before them the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. So he's talking against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. So he's talking about the stoning of James, the half-brother of Jesus, who led the Jerusalem church in the early part of the church history. And he's verifying that. But he also is verifying Jesus who was called the Christ. So there's evidence that Jesus, if I could have just shown that writing to my professor, I said, who, who's Josephus talking about here? There's more. Um, this is from his, his, I guess his testimonium, which would be like his diary. Uh, now there was about this time Jesus in deeds. Josephus is writing this. Josephus is no friend of the Christian church here. Um, a teacher of such men has received truth with pleasure. Think about that for a minute. It's a teacher of such men who received truth. Uh, so he's a teacher of wise men. Uh, and, he gained a, uh, and he gained a following both among many Jews and many of, the Greek, uh, of Greek origin. And when Pilate, so there's Pontius Pilate who enters into this, right? When Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, among the Jews, condemned him to the us, among the Jews, condemned him to the cross. These are elements of Christ's life that are being verified by an external historian. Uh, Those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. The tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. There's a lot in there, isn't there? I mean, if, if, if you could show that to someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, they, they are going to be confronted with some central points of Christian doctrine. Jesus lived. He, had, he performed startling deeds. He, was, he, had, he performed startling deeds. He was sentenced to die on a Roman cross, uh, and he was not forsaken after that by his followers. They uh, and their followers have grown to this day. Does that make sense? I, I, don't, I hope you find that interesting. Let me move on. To, uh, this is Tacitus. I tried to get, you know, uh, like Facebook pictures of them. There, there really aren't. So uh, the historian Tacitus went by Publius Cornelius Tacitus, of course. We all need three good uh, Latin names. I think we should. That could be like a class contest to come up with Wade, you know, something. I don't know. What, uh, he was a senator. And he was, he's most renowned as one of the famous historians. That's what he really did. And he lived at a time uh, between 56 and 120, approximately, A.D. There was a lot going on in the Roman Empire. So if you want the history of the is your best source for that. This is uh, what he wrote about Jesus. Christus, Christus, the founder of the Christian name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procur- procurator of Judea, In the reign of Tiberius, but the pernicious superstition repressed for a where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also. And this is dated 116. So within a hundred years of the death and resurrection of Jesus, a non-Christian historian is marking some pretty important doctrines of the Christian faith. Does, I mean, can I stop for a minute? Are you faith? Does, I mean, can I stop for a minute? Are you picking up on this? I hope so, because this is really important. Look at what he details for us. Pontius Pilate, Judea, under Tiberius. So this coincides with all the times and dates we're told in the Bible. 
told in the Bible. Pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out again. Now, he's not saying it, but the, the, the belief later is that Jesus was, was rose, risen back to life. That's the pernicious superstition he's talking about. It, and it, it was, they, I, I might welcome you pernicious, mischievous people next Sunday. That's what we were to the Roman Empire at the time. But it didn't, it didn't just start there. It spread, and it started to spread throughout the world, and it made its way to Rome by 116 AD. Again, this follows what we would believe. I hope this makes sense. I just liked his name. He really didn't say anything of value whatsoever. But now, this was interesting to me because he ver verified a fact that is, uh, that is directly from the book of Acts. He was writing of the emperor Claudius. By the way, there was a very interesting year where Rome had four emperors. By the way, there was a very interesting year where Rome had four emperors. And many of the historians, like Suetonius, became famous because they were close to that. A lot of things going on, obviously, politically. And he wrote about that. And in his writings of one of those emperors, Claudius, he expelled from Rome the Jews about that. And in his writings of one of those emperors, Claudius, he expelled from Rome the Jews, constantly making disturbances, disturbances at the instigation of Christus. Okay? So in other words... The, the, the Jews that had become Christians is what he's talking about. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, look at this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he had met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And this is not the only fact. This is a of other things we can find verified in the Bible. Questions? Does that make sense? Here's, here's one that um, may not prove a whole lot to us, but um, a guy named Mara Bon Seraphin, or Serapion. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. By the way, Bar means son, and he wrote a letter to his son who was named Serapion, so it was kind of hard to keep these guys straight. But So the Mara is the guy who was a Stoic philosopher in the province of Syria. He wrote this letter uh, to his son, and it's been accurately dated to have been written in 73 AD. What he's telling his son, started the rebellion, never quashed the rebellion. And he gives the example of Christians at the end. So listen, uh, I'll try and read this to you. What advantage did the Athenians gain from murdering Socrates? Famine and plague came upon them as a punishment for their crime. What advantage did the men of Samos gain from burning Pythagoras and was covered with sand? It was just after that their kingdom was abolished. God justly avenged these three wise men. The Athenians died of hunger, the Samians were overwhelmed by the sea, and the Jews, desolate and driven from their own kingdom, live in complete dispersion. But as of Plato, neither is Pythagoras because of the statue of Juno, nor is the wise king because of the new law he laid down. He's talking about the fact that they tried to suppress the rebellion of the Christians by killing the wise king, his reference to Jesus, but his new law Christians by killing the wise king, his reference to Jesus, but his new law, the new command I give unto you, survived to this day. I think that's beautiful, don't you? So the, if, if you're in a argument, discussion with an atheist, the argument, discussion with an atheist that does not want you to use the Bible, pull out these sources. Tell them to go look some of these up. Maybe the best, which I think is the last one, because I, I don't want to bore you with these, but uh, th these are some of the best. This is Pliny, who was a Roman governor of Turkey, and he's sometimes referred to as Pliny the Younger, which I, I guess infers that there would have been a Pliny the Elder, right? So uh, he wrote a letter to the emperor Trajan at the time. Uh, it would have been 112 AD when Trajan was emperor, and he was having people conducting trials for people that were Christians, and he didn't know what to do. So he wrote to Trajan, and Trajan wrote back. And it's really interesting. You can gain a lot of insight into the Christian church. So here's his letter written to Trajan. 
He says, meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christian, he says, meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have followed the following procedure. I interrogated them as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. Now, this is really important. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. Now, this is really important because according to the early church, you, by renouncing Christ, could save your life. He gives us direct testimony of that. Three times he asked you, are you a Christian? All you got to say is no once, and he lets you go. Right? Uh, yeah. Then he, at one point, there were enough of these happening that he wanted to really interrogate a couple. So he, he interrogated them. They affirmed, however, that the whole of their guilt, in other words, the only thing that was the, their mistake was that they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light when they sang an alternative as to a God. You see the deity of Jesus being established there among Christian followers? That's beautiful. Uh, and bound themselves to a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, not to deny a trust. This is what he squeezed out of two ladies before he had to kill them because they wouldn't deny they were Christians. That's the, all they were guilty of. Isn't that interesting? And now, the major doctrinal thing that establishes is that Christians believed Jesus was God. And, and, and that's, that's, that's important to us. But it's also taught, meeting before dawn, I'm not too hip to, right? But the idea of meeting and singing songs, sharing a meal, making vows to be better people in how we represent Jesus to people, that doesn't save us, but it's part of what the church has been doing for 2,000 years. And we didn't read any of that from our Bible. 2,000 years. And we didn't read any of that from our Bible. I can assure there's plenty of that in your Bible. But the reason I like showing you this is the question of who is Jesus is something the world desperately needs to know. And the minute you pick up your Bible and begin reading from it, you're suspect. And begin reading from it, you're suspect. And, and I think sometimes, sometimes it might be better to start with some secular sources. Read what this guy Pliny said about Christians. And, or read what this guy said about that. I've found that occasionally that's very disarming. It certainly takes away the argument I faced as a young man. It certainly takes away the argument I faced as a young man that Jesus may never have even existed. See, nobody's talking about that now after reading this. As a matter of fact, what you now get to talk about is, what, 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 let's see what we can learn about the nature of Jesus just from these things we've read. And that's what I'd like to talk about. What I'd like to talk about. What? can we learn about the nature of Jesus? Well, the, you get the testimony to his existence and his brother James and, and verifying some of the early church. I like the fact that he get a testimony to the fact that he was doer of startling deeds. I like that. Some of this terminology I wish I should adopt on Sunday and then it'll just, especially the pernicious mischief that, that Milo's up to, right? He was a, a teacher of truth-seeking men, right? That, that, that's a beautiful term for that. He gained a large following when he was alive. That's testified to, because obviously it was a large following and, and it, it, Pilate condemned Jesus to die on a cross. That Jesus established a new law that survived and even grew after his death. Those are things you could learn about Jesus from just those writings. Does that make sense? So I guess my point is, you know, I think it makes sense for us to look to revelation from God. But if, you, if you're dealing with somebody that doesn't want to do that, I hope this secures your faith a little bit. And the reason that we, that's, that's another part of why we call this basic training. Because when something terrible happens in your life, and you want to know that this is all real, and you're on your knees before the Lord, you know, it's really important to have some of this background knowledge that says, yes, this is real. This game we're playing. There's a real creator of the universe. He really loves you. And he really came in the man named Jesus, just as we read about every Sunday in our Bible. Amen? Okay. Questions? You guys just stunned right now? Is that the deal? Let, let me move on a little bit because I think there's other things that you can the deal. Let, let me move on a little bit because I think there's other things that you can infer just about Christianity in general from this. One of the things we get is testimony to how James died, verifying what was written uh, in, in church history. 
ver historical verification of dozens of facts from the dozens of facts from the book of Acts. One specifically we looked into chapter 18. We get something here that the early Christians chose death rather than renounce Jesus or worship other gods. You know, I, I got to tell you something. I mean, you hear stories of Columbine where a young lady is, is asked, you know, are you a Christian and, and, and life and death? You know, and I wonder, you know, I really do. I'm just, just trying to be, shoot it completely straight. I wonder if I'd have the courage in that moment to say the same thing. I, I wonder. I'm, I'm a frail and fallible human being. You put a gun in my face, who knows what I'd confess. These early believers three times had the chance to get off the hook. Lots of time to think about it. They never did. Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, the question was, did James die along with Jesus? James is the half-brother of Jesus. He wrote this book of James. He was made the leader of the church in Jerusalem, which was the largest, and it's where things were starting for a long time. In Jerusalem, which was the largest, and it's where things were starting for a long time. He was martyred. He's among the earliest martyrs for his faith. As soon as they discovered he was the leader of the church there, the Romans rounded him up and had him stoned to death. And I think the question as to whether the Romans or the Jews did it is, is one that we could debate. But does that one that we could debate? But does that, that's James that we're talking about here. Does that, does that make sense? There was also a James that was one of the disciples, one of the uh, apostles, and that's, that's a little bit confusing. He also was martyred for his faith. Uh, he was the brother of John, who lived the longest of all of the 12 apostles. Okay? Uh, they practiced, the practice involved meals and oaths to moral living, right? We, we know that. Those who loved Jesus remained loyal in death. Jesus' following grew after his death. All these people testified to that. And the belief that Jesus came back to life, came back to life, persists. That pernicious thing just kept, kept going on. So without touching your Bible, that's what the history the atheist history of the world tells you about Jesus. Did you know that was that much history about Jesus? Because I think sometimes we buy into this lie. Because I think sometimes we buy into this lie that it's all the Bible and the Bible was just written by people. And it, you know, there's, it's a very historical document and outside sources prove it every day, as well as archaeology. So there's a couple of other observations I would make, even though they weren't in those writings. But they're things that we can infer based upon the fact that we've observed history. And one of them is that the Christian movement grew in a hostile environment. I mean, we've got a couple of Roman governors talking about how they're killing and interrogating Christians. And we've got Jewish people that are talked about the pernicious movement. So that's not how typically movements grow. If someone's trying to say that Christianity was just a false movement of the... It, wouldn't have grown or taken seed in the soil that it was planted in, right? Neither Jews nor Romans were friendly to Christians. Early Christians held Jesus as God. This is really an important, do important doctrine. He was not just a good teacher. Otherwise, they would have had no problem swearing allegiance to another God to save their own life, would they? Right? I mean, seriously, I want you to think about that. If you're one of these Christians that Tacitus is, is questioning and you don't think Jesus is really God, you're not going to die, right? Is really God? You're not going to die, right? I, mean, I like you, Wade, but I'm not going to die for you. I don't think you're really God, right? And this is why James, the half-brother of Jesus, what, do any of you have brothers and sisters? I have two sisters. Do you know what it would take to convince me that one of them was divine? <laughs> Only them rising from... Right? I, 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 so it really is a very powerful thing. There's something else that I will I'll assert here, and that Jesus' tomb was empty. I, how it got empty is something that you and your neighbors can talk about, but there's no way this movement persists, this pernicious super stone, and say, you mean that dead guy there is the one you're following? So Jesus' tomb had to have been empty or absolutely no such belief in his resurrection or deity could have spread. And even secular historians acknowledge, yes, the tomb was probably empty. They believe it was a plot empty. They believe it was a plot that someone else would have moved it. You know, I, we can talk about that if you want. I mean, like if Peter and John moved the body, why would Peter die for that? 
for a lie that he created. And what did he get out of it? Fame? No, imprisoned. And what did he get out of it? Fame? No, imprisonment and death, right? John had a lifetime of that kind of harassment as well. So I don't know why, uh, but the, the, the rumor persists that the, the tomb was emptied by someone. But even that acknowledges a Jewish story that someone stole the body, if you read that, and they say, tell everybody that someone stole the body, acknowledges that the body wasn't there. Does that make sense? That's right. That's, so that's the, the amen moment is, however you try and explain this, there's no body in the tomb. That gives me real kind of passed on. I mean, this, is, this has to be real for me, or I don't want to play. Okay. Let me take a little break here. Let's, let's go back now to the Bible, shall we? Maybe you've been anxious to get there. But I think it's really powerful in light of what other people have said about Jesus. I remember a, a, a gentleman I worked with claiming that Jesus never really claimed to be God. And I did not know my Bible well enough to refute that. You don't have to know your Bible very well to refute that. That's, that's, a, that's a ridiculous claim with, if with just a, a cursory reading of any of the four Gospels own words, that his words and deeds are those of God living in him. And I, there's probably lots of verses I could have chose, but I, I like the Gospel of John chapter 14. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even, I've, even after I've been among you such a long time, Philip, even, I've, even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidences of the miracles themselves, the doer of the startling deeds. Right? So Jesus claimed... That he was in the Father, and the Father, he, I and the Father are one. About his words and deeds that would be those of God himself. This one's a short one. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Can you just imagine if I stood up here some Sunday and said something like that? You, you should laugh if a mere mortal said something like that. Even the President of the United States would not have the gall to say, will never pass away. The condition at the front of that is just, it's laughable. In other words, at the destruction of all the universe and everything that you can see and know, my words are still going to remain. That, if that isn't a claim to be God, I just don't know what is. It's one of the most stunning ones that I know, and it's pretty succinct. Jesus also, Jesus also made promises that only God can make. Right? So this is kind of important. Uh, in John 10, therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate, whoever enters through, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate, whoever enters through will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. By the way, that, that goes on to say, I know my sheep and my sheep hear my voice, which was one of the instrumental verses. That goes on to say, I know my sheep and my sheep hear my voice, which was one of the instrumental verses in my own salvation. Because I, I was hearing God speak to me. And when I read that verse, I, I finally connected the last dots. That, oh, I'm, I'm one of the sheep. That wasn't a flattering conclusion, but, oh, I'm, I'm one of the sheep. That wasn't a flattering conclusion, but it was one that is salvific, thankfully. But you, you get that. I, I've come that they may have life. Can anyone claim, I mean, seriously, to claim to offer life to people? That, that, that's, you know, to offer, it, it's knowledge once a week. Or interpretation. Or, or my spin on, on Bible verses. Can you imagine the hubris of someone that claims to offer life? Right? <laughs> That's, that's outrageous, or, or it's true. He made promises that only God can make to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. This is Mark chapter 2, right? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, 
I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. They praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. In other words, I'm healing this guy, but you might just think that that's some special healing that I'm doing here on earth. I want you to know that this healing is a simple sign that I have authority to do more that you cannot see. A promise only God can make. You know, Neil, if you did something uh, uh, against Patty and I, I forgave you instead of Patty forgiving you, Patty would be outraged. Right? I, how could I possibly forgive you of your sin unless somehow I'm also Patty's creator? unless somehow I'm also Patty's creator as well. And when David says against you and you alone have I sinned, he, he, he's telling us this all, this all tears up to a creator of all of our souls, a lover of all of our souls. And when Jesus says, I forgive you of all of our souls, and when Jesus says, I forgive you of your sin, it's because, first of all, he can. Uh, and, and he proves that. Because he does something on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Isn't that beautiful? I love this. We could do this all night, I suppose. And my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. If he isn't God, somebody should tell him. Right? And, and I think, you know, uh, th this leads, well, I guess I can have another one. I don't want to bore you too many with these. One of my favorites is that Jesus accepted worship, right? If Jesus wasn't divine or he knew he wasn't divine, he wouldn't be accepting worship. In, we talked about this in Luke 17. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had Luke 17. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy uh, met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him as he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Everywhere else in the Bible, when someone hits their knees... They're told, no, get up. Even angels tell John, no, get up. I'm, we're just men. We're, I'm a fellow servant like you. Jesus. Now, that, that makes me laugh a little bit, but only someone who certainly thought they were God would accept the worship of God. Amen? Yeah, Dave. Yeah, Dave just brought up something, if you didn't hear it, his favorite verse, good. He said, I, I missed this one, and you're right. On 848, bef before Abraham was, I am. And the use of I am caused them to pick up rocks and try and stone him. Because it was, the, the, the words I am were what Moses asked God, you know, whom shall I say ascending? And when, when the Jews heard that... Um, there was no doubt. There was, and and that, was, that, was the one, that was the way they identified God, is the one who is. Right? Isn't that interesting? So, I mean, and, and, and it's funny to me that maybe we've kind of come back in a cultural cycle to the point where I need to begin by telling you about the one who is. Right? Elohim. Uh, yeah. So, so Barb, Barb's point is that, is that sometimes we just need to have the courage to go ahead and share what we believe and share the truth with people. And you know what? I, I completely agree with that. I do think, though, the Bible tells us that that is done best when it's done in relationship. So, though, the Bible tells us that that is done best when it's done in relationship. So the idea of springing on board a bus and telling everybody that is probably not as effective. But, right. That, that's right. So asking people about their story and telling you yours in that, people about their story and telling you yours in that relational context should be okay. But in some ways it's thought of, you know, I, I'm, you guys know I'm from Iowa. And in Iowa, people don't so freely share where they go to church. It's not that they don't. The churches are packed, or at least they were for a long time. I don't know what kind of doctrine they're teaching, but line. You would never share with somebody, hey, you ought to come to our church. When I, when I moved here to the Bible Belt, uh, I was amazed at how open people were about that. Now, 
the good news, bad news, is that not everybody that was inviting me to church was listening and practicing what was actually being taught there. And that's always been the problem, hasn't it? Right? Sitting in a chicken house doesn't make you a chicken, right? And, and any more than sitting in a church makes you a Christian. So we, we, the idea of being loving, being caring, and sometimes the best gospel you can share, the way you start to build that relationship with people, is to do those things that the, Christians, the early Christians took the oath to do. Do nothing false. To help, the early Christians took the oath to do. Do nothing false to help people, to show them. And, and at some point, you'll have that opportunity to share with them why it is you have hope. Always be prepared, the Bible says, to give a reason for the hope that lies within you. Not why you have all the answers, why you're such a smart aleck. Not why you have all the answers, why you're such a smart aleck. Now, that's how I read that verse for too long in my life. Be prepared to offer why you have hope. And so when terrible things happen to you, like they happen to other people, at some point in your life, your coworkers might ask, why are you so calm? They're laying off 30 people, right? Well, because why are you so calm? They're laying off 30 people, right? Well, because, because I know the creator of the world, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm not as worried about that. Then, you know, presidents come and go, world leaders come and go. I, I know, I know the maker of all things. I know he'll take care of me. You know, it's all going to be okay. And that's, you've now, okay. And that's, you've now given a reason for the hope that lies within you. L- let me move on for a minute here because I want to, I want to uh, conclude some of this. This is C.S. Lewis, if you've ever heard. And, and, you know, if, if you know someone that is just learning about Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote about the Christian faith and about the real Christian faith. And he writes this about Jesus. And it's probably something that you've seen before. I'm going to read it to you just to enter it into the record. Uh, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would, who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit on him and and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And I think part of what we're saying is Jesus made statements that if he is not God, he's crazy. And and we need to acknowledge that. Saying, you know, things like, I and the Father are one, you know, I, I forgive you of your sins. So, the, the, one of the things that, then, that we say this, I'm, I don't mean this to be confrontational, but in a world where people like to walk around and say, well, I believe Jesus was this, or I believe Jesus was that, you know, at some point they really have not applied their brain well enough to, those, to the facts, have not applied their brain well enough to, those, to the facts about Jesus. Because the facts about Jesus don't leave open middle ground. And unfortunately, when, when Christ says you're either with me or for me or against me, this is kind of what he means. If you think about what he said, and by the way, I don't even think you have to, what he said. And by the way, I don't even think you have to f- take what he said in the Bible. I think just the, the other historians that wrote about him, you have to either accept him as one or the other, right? And that, there've been, a book was written called Liar, Lunatic, or Lord, among the same thing. It, it's, there's, there's only a few options that you've got there. The same thing. It, it's, there's, there's only a few options that you've got there. Okay, I'm going to move quickly through what some of the disciples said about Jesus. Um, and uh, the gospel writer John said this. John spent the most time with Jesus. He was among the earliest disciples. Um, and he wrote this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the word, uh, the word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The Word became flesh and made glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And that, that's such a powerful statement. Uh, what he's saying there is a really, really interesting thought. And I want to share with you an, an analogy that might help you get this a little bit. I get or know who Kurt Vonnegut is. I can't really recommend him as an author. He's an atheist. He's a humanist. Uh, he, he wrote more science fiction, 
But there's some things clever about his writing, okay? So uh, he, he, he was, you know, uh, renowned. That's a picture of him on the right. He wrote a book called Breakfast of Champions. One of the characters, at one point in this book, Breakfast of Champions, I, I, do any, have any of you, I mean, I just, it's not embarrassing in church to admit you've read a Kurt Vonnegut novel, okay? You so see, you've read some Vonnegut. Have you, did, have you actually read Breakfast of Champions? Or moment? He was in the Battle of the Bulge. He was captured for a time and he was released. He served his country. I'm not trying to make him out to be a, a total evil guy, although he was, in the end, more of an atheist and his, his fate is in the hands of the Lord. I want to read to you a little bit of an essay that was written about this book for just a minute. Science fiction novelist Kurt Vonnegut once said of one of his most re- character I ever created who had enough imagination to suspect that he might be the creation of another human being. So he's writing about one of the characters in one of his novels that was clever enough to suspect that he might be a character in a novel. He had spoken of this possibility several times to his parakeet. That's trout, apparently. The parakeet. That's trout, apparently. The Kilgore trout is the character that had spoken to his parakeet about the fact that, you know, I might just be a character in somebody else's novel. In a scene from the book Breakfast of Champions, Kilgore Trout's haunting suspicion is unveiled before him. Sitting content at the bar, Kilgore is suddenly is unveiled before him. Sitting content at the bar, Kilgore is suddenly overwhelmed by someone or something that has entered the room. Beginning to sweat, he becomes uncomfortably aware of a presence far greater than himself. This is from his book, Breakfast of Champions. The author himself and himself. This is from his book, Breakfast of Champions. The author himself, Kurt Vonnegut, has stepped beyond the role of narrator and into the book itself. The effect is as bizarre for Kilgore as it is for the readers. When the author of the book steps into the novel, fiction is lost within a higher reality. And Kilgore, the novel, fiction is lost within a higher reality. And Kilgore senses the world as he knows it is collapsing. In fact, this was the author's intent. Vonnegut has placed himself in Kilgore's world for no other reason than to explain to Kilgore face to face that the very tiresome head was, in fact, all due to the pen and whims of an author. In this twisted ending, no doubt illustrative of Vonnegut's own humanism, Kilgore is forced to conclude that apart from the imagination of the author, he does not exist. Ironically, he also must come to terms with the fact that, uh, that, it, has, it, that it is because of ridiculous. The reason I bring this up is Vonnegut, who was a, a humanist and an atheist, creates a scene where the author himself steps into one of his own novels to interact with one of his characters. Bizarre, isn't it? That's what God has, is Jesus. Jesus is the author come to interfere in a salvific way with his novel with his creation. Planned well ahead of time, he's come here of his own volition and he stepped in and he has, as a universe has stepped into it and offers a chance to talk to you and me. That is the person of Jesus Christ. I hope that makes sense. Again, I wouldn't run out and buy Breakfast of Champions or read the book, but I really think it's a fascinating suggestion and especially one from an author that does an ultimate God scene in one of his own novels. I hope that's as interesting to you as it always has been to me. Uh, there's a great essay written about that and, you know, talking about how uh, this, is, this is really, uh, G.K. Chesterton says, I've always felt life is first a story. Able to touch the story of our lives with a hand and a face in order that we might know him and grasp that we are known. His is the story we are invited to see as our own. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, okay, Wade, let me quote that for the record. G.K. Chesterton said, if you don't believe in God, you'll believe in... Chesterton said, if you don't believe in God, you'll believe in anything. So I, I do think that there's a portion of that. Without having some transcendent anchoring to your morals, uh, even to truth, you eventually just basically are cutting off your rope that you eventually just basically are cutting off your rope that keeps you tied and moored to the shore and you float 
at the whim of whatever dominant thought you happen to have. Okay. Uh, gosh, I've got, I've got a lot more Bible quotes for you. But, gosh, I've got, I've got a lot more Bible quotes for you. But um, let me skip many of those. I'll, I'll just tell you others where we hear about what the, the apostle said. Peter, uh, in 2 Peter first, uh, one, uh, verse 1 and 16 through 18, talks about how we, uh, verse 1 and 16 through 18, talks about how we, we received honor and glory from God the Father, talking about who Jesus was. This is, he said, I was the one who heard the voice saying, this is the, the one I love and I am well pleased with him. So Peter was there when he heard that. And he wrote, Philippians is written by Paul. Uh, he talks about your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. Paul also wrote in Colossians that he is the image of the invisible God. But I want to kind of maybe, oh, and also, for in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily, as a character in his own book, with all of the independent thoughts and powers of the author. That's a character in his own book. Paul also wrote this, and I, I kind of maybe we'll make this our last, um, as we kind of bring this to a close. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers. At the same time, some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. And I think what's really interesting about this is there's an awful lot of basic Christian doctrine in this. As far as this is what I'm passing on, what I Christian doctrine in this, as far as this is what I'm passing on, what I've learned, well, this could not have developed before, you know, this, this Paul's probably writing this in the early 50s AD. 50 to 60, 60 would be the latest. So you've got within a generation a lot So you've got within a generation a lot of doctrinal development here. But something really interesting was, again, I, I think I told you, to convince me one of my sisters was divine, I'd have to see her raised from the dead. Paul's claiming a lot of people did. And many of them, when he says most are still alive, he's saying, you can go talk this up. You know, later he goes on to say, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, we're, we're fooling ourselves. We're to be pitied. But what's really interesting about this to me is, is how early this doctrine is. I mean, among the earliest writings, at the time when he would have been writing this, this may have been some of the earliest revelations I've written this letter to the church in Corinth, documenting a lot of these things. The, of the 12 apostles, of course, Judas hanged himself not long uh, after turning over Jesus. Of the 11 remaining, and if we add Paul back, that gets 11 remaining, and if we add Paul back, that gets us back to 12. Uh, all but one is believed to have been executed. John, the gospel writer John, is the only one who died a natural death, but he died in prison, in captivity, exiled on the Isle of Patmos. I guess you'd have to ask, since they exiled on the Isle of Patmos, I guess you'd have to ask, since they, each of them died, and in many cases, much like we heard with Tacitus, could have saved their own lives by recanting, do you think they believed that Jesus was just a good moral teacher? Do you think they would have, this was just a good moral teacher? Do you think they would have sacrificed everything they had, their families, their fortunes, and their lives, uh, if they didn't think he was God. And that's, I think that's, I think they not only believed he was God, they not only believed he was God, they believed they had seen him raised from the dead. And I find that testimony compelling. That, that you know, if one person had deluded himself into thinking that, I'm not sure I'd be as compelled a follower. But when 12 and then 500 and then others to do so as having seen the risen Christ. So I, I will we'll leave on that writing 
because I think it's so important. It's one I go back to. I, I, I hope we can be honest about the fact that we all have doubts from time to time. And people in our families have doubts. And you probably have people that go to other churches, their doubts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Paul believed that all this was arranged ahead of time for him. He was, and, and he, he uh, uh, believed that he, all of his life, I mean, the question, let me repeat it for anybody listening, the question of chosen ahead of time to be the recipient of this, and he didn't deserve it. He, he, he ends up having Christ appear to him like he was one of the apostles just because of a weird fate that God arranged ahead of time. Does that make sense? Uh, it doesn't mean that he was born with any normality. It just meant he's, he's, he's being very self-deprecating. Instead of letting that puff him up, as to say, instead of, because I was special. You know, because you could deride that from the fact that God chose you to be the one person who he's going to teach the gospel to by himself. The one person who he's going to teach the gospel to by himself. Right? No man taught Paul the gospel. Christ taught him the gospel himself when he was in the desert. That's a, you, know, that, you can flash that badge in any church you want, and that should get you somewhere. Right? So Paul could have pulled the apostle card, but he didn't. He, he puts, pulled the apostle card, but he didn't. He, he puts himself least as one abnormally born. So the, that's the way, reason he describes himself that way. Chosen, but not because of anything special. Does that make sense? That's a great question. So let me ask you then, what do you say? Who do you say I am? Is one Jesus asked his disciples. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they gave him a bunch of answers. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What about you? You can't control what your neighbor or your coworker says. The one thing to make sure you've got straight, who do you, when, who do you say Jesus was? Because that's the most important question you'll ever answer in your lifetime. I hope tonight has reinforced a decision that maybe you've been living, reinforced a decision that maybe you've been living through your whole life that you believe Jesus was God. God's son who came here to be the author entering into the novel to offer you salvation. But that's the most important question any human being will ever answer. Who do you say I am? And it's, I answer, who do you say I am? And it's ironically, interestingly enough to, that we'll be talking about this a little bit Sunday as well. I'll probably tell a joke too. Yes! Uh, so the, the, the observation is that Paul's life, observation is that Paul's life being such an opponent of Jesus early on, coming, uh, actually kind of being dragging and kicking to salvation, right? If you read what happened on, on, on the, the road to Damascus, uh, Paul's life offers hope for others in our, for others in our sphere, loved ones, that don't seem to be turning, that don't seem to be receptive. You know, Jesus does say to you as ears, let him hear. And within that is an acknowledgement that is very real that we need to recognize, which is not everybody is hearing, not everybody's tuned into this. I was not for a long time in my life, resonate with me, maybe because I thought they were mythology. I don't know. Um, but then there was a time when, when I began to hear with ears and see what, you know, because a veil was lifted. And I, so I, I, as we encounter people, especially our loved ones, you know, I know that we've given the good seed and our best testimony and we still have to walk away and there's no decision right in front of us yet. And that is the hope that we have with Paul's life yet. And, and it, it, it may mean that we weren't meant to pick that fruit right watering. Please don't giving up fertilizing the, those people. And maybe, you know, practice your approach. Maybe we need to back up and say, you know what, fundamentally, is it, are, are you not, do you not agree with the Bible? Do you believe there's a God at all? You know, sometimes you have to kind of back things up. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not They're going to argue anyone into the kingdom, right? Um, but I, I do think that, that we each have and are called to be the best witnesses we can 
being loving, always caring, respectful, with gentleness and respect, right? And then being sensitive to where, where are you? Where are you? Where are you right now in your walk? Do you, do you, what do you, where are you, where are you right now in your walk? Do you, do you, what do you believe? What do you, where do you find your truth? What's your source of information, right? What trips your trigger, you know? And, and there's, there's lots of ways that God uses different people and different things. You know, um, my sisters tell a story. They came, you know, um, my sisters tell a story. They came to Christ long before I, well, uh, maybe 10 years before I did. And they, in those 10 years, they, they're, um, if they're, if one of them's listening to this right now, I'm in real trouble. But, you know, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't listening to them. I heard someone else. I wasn't listening to them. I heard someone else. And all of a sudden, the same things they said came alive and I listened. And that, you know, we have to be prepared to be that offense, offended, right? Because it doesn't matter whether I'm the instrument, right? Because the message is more important than the messenger. And that's so it has to be. So, but guys, please keep going. You know, who, which of you, are you guys, Doug, are you, Dave, are you yielding to Barb? Is that the deal? Great point, Barb, and thank you. Let me, let, me, let me get that on the record right now. Barb's point is that after Jesus asked, the response, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed this. In other words, no man told you this, but this came from my father. And that's an illustration to all of us that this is revelation, isn't it? And it has to come from that. Okay, I'm sorry. First point is that one of the ways that we can help those of our loved ones is, is to, to, first of all, how can I be your servant? Please, Lord, speak to this person. Remove the obstacles from their path to you. Open their ears. Unstop their, their mind and open their eyes. And also, how can I always focus on ourselves? Dave, did you have something? Yeah. Dave's point is that, that sometimes we, 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 another thing we can ask God to intervene in, bring someone into their life that, that will command their respect, that will speak the truth. Can I just, real quick show of hands, how many of you have a loved one right now that you, you would, would really like to have reach and that, that you're struggling with? You know, yeah, I think that's, that's almost always the case, isn't it? I mean, and, you know, for me, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to say who it is because I'm kind of hoping that, that maybe one of these lessons might find its way. kind of hoping that, that maybe one of these lessons might find its way. Uh, but it's always been true for me. There seems to always be someone on my heart that I'm thinking of when we think about how, how we can be a better witness, how, how we can bring someone into their life. And I think that that is... It gets someone into their life. And I think that that is, it gives us just a little bit of insight into how the Lord feels about us too, doesn't it? The lost but loved. Well, I, I really hope that this is, has been a, a valuable exercise as we look into Jesus. We look into what, uh, of what history has said about him, what the Bible says about him, what, uh, of what history has said about him, what the Bible says about him, what, what Kurt Vonnegut said about him without even knowing about him. Right? Our own experience with him is still the most valuable. Uh, Jesus didn't just do all this so that he could be praised. He did it so and have time with you, whether it's in the morning or whether it's on the way home tonight. Um, and so, you know, reward him for his efforts. Give him some of your time, please. Let me close this in a word of prayer and we can hang around here for a little bit and we'll see if uh, we've, we've survived the storm that was uh, uh, into your novel. First of all, what a beautiful story. We're, we're, we're delighted to be characters in it and ones that you love and cared about enough to be the work of your pen, the creation of, of, of your creative genius. And we don't always think of ourselves that way. We are and we are and you love us and you loved us enough to come into, enough to come into this world. To, to give up being God in order to be God and man so that you, you would die, so that we would, you, we, you would be, have empathy with us um, to die as we all must die. But the exchanges that you offer us righteousness and life, but the exchanges that you offer us righteousness and life that we could never have had on our own. And we're so glad that you are who you are. 
that you are God. And we just, we would ask, Father, that you would lead us to people that we might be the person someone else was praying would come into the lives of one of their loved ones. Um, what Jesus has done for us, that we would love them, that we would care for them. Maybe we don't even need to use words to be a witness into their lives. And that we would be bold when the time comes to share our faith in you. But that you need no defense. You are God. And we need to do that to more and more. But all for your